feel alone. Lord, help me to keep going. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, that little bumper intro video, which is building each week, is a perfect metaphor uh, than one we're going to look at in, de in depth for the life of faith. In addition to recognizing the back of those heads, I know those guys are part of our church family. Uh, it's, it's a great picture of what it means to live this life of faith. And whether you're here right now with us, or those, especially to those of you that are watching over on our Kesslinger campus on video, uh, this is something we need to pay attention to, and we're excited, I'm excited, to talk about. When my son Benjamin was just a little four or five year old boy, my youngest child, he sometimes would call me on my cell phone at church here, or the office phone, and he would say, Dad, Dad, who are you today? Meaning, what superhero was I going to be that day? And I would tell him, you know, whoever I was. And he would say, okay, okay, I'm Superman, or I'm Batman. He'd tell me who he was. And then we'd, I'd go home and we'd have these imaginary superhero wars because in his mind, every day was a story he was creating. And eventually he got tired of losing, because I would explain to him why Spider-Man can't beat Superman. He invented a superhero called Wild Wind, who was invisible, who could fly, who was as strong as the Hulk, who had x-ray vision. He had all powers of all heroes combined, so I could never win anymore. <laughs> he was living inside his own story, which is cute when you're four or five. Donald Miller uh, wrote a book, and in this, the introduction to his book, Blue Like Jazz, he talks about a young girl who was rebelling and running away from her family. Her, her father said, I don't understand it. I, she won't come to church. She's behaving in ways that just aren't like her. And it was related to this guy that she was dating who he didn't approve of. And Miller says, this was a friend of his, he said to him, well, I think she's just chosen a better story. And her dad said, what are you talking about? He said, well, you know, your home life is, they were, their marriage was in shambles and they were struggling and it was, her faith was repress, op oppressive and she felt like, this young man is a prince, a guy I can rescue. It's a better story. He goes on to tell a story about how that dad, in desperation to reach his daughter, reorganized the family's life. They sold their business. They moved down to Mexico to build an orphanage. They needed to change everything. And the girl, over time, dumped the guy. Because she, basically she said, well, look, we're going to save children in Mexico, and you're a loser, so I'm not going out with you anymore. A different story. We all, whether we're conscious of it or not, see our lives as part of a story. There's a story, whether you see it or not, that's shaping your life and how the decisions you make and how you live. We all do this. It's just not as obvious as a little boy acting like a superhero. There are lots of different and competing stories in our culture, ways we see life. Let me give you a couple of them that I notice. One from the 1980s or late 80s, early 90s song, Life is a Highway, right? This image, life is a highway. You're just going with the flow of traffic. There's lots of on-ramps and off-ramps. You're not really even sure sometimes where you're headed, but you seem to be in a hurry to get there. Or to quote the great philosopher and theologian Forrest Gump, life is like a box of chocolates. Mama always said... Right? You never know what you're going to get. I always hated box of chocolates because it felt like a bad joke when I was a kid. My mom would get these chocolates and I always picked the ones with like some terrible cherry filling. <laughs> Put it back. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> or, or life is a roller coaster. There's ups, there's downs. It can be thrilling, it can be terrifying. You want to get off sometimes. 
Or, <laughs> I know some people who live this way, life is a romance novel. Now, I had to work to find a cover of a romance novel online that was showable in church. <laughs> I, apparently, in romance novels, all the guys aren't wearing shirts, but... <laughs> where you're the author and the hero or heroine of your own story, right? And every day is a new chapter that you get to write, living your life like that. Or some of you think of life this way. Life is a hamster wheel or a rat race. I'm exhausted and it never ends. When will it stop? Last, more common, the acronym YOLO. You only live once. This has been around. The, the acronym hashtag YOLO, you only live once, has been around, is new, but this idea is from the Epicurean philosophers in Greece, ancient Greece. It's been around a long time. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Do what you want. Do what makes you happy. You only go around once in life. There are many, many others, but as Christ followers, we recognize that we're part of a different story. That's not our story. Life might feel like that at times, but that's not the story we're in. We're in a better story, a greater story, the greatest story. Jesus gives us the greater story. And one of the key metaphors for the life of faith in Jesus is given to us in Hebrews chapter 12. You heard a portion of it read a moment ago in that video. Let me read to you now verses 1 through 10 of Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons or children. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are disciplined, not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're illegitimate and not, children, not true ch sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. We'll stop there. This passage, particularly the first two verses, have become a bit of a life verse for me. In fact, it was written down and given to me by a college teammate of mine many years ago, and I still have that card somewhere. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, if you've been with us, last week we're in a series called Jesus is Greater. The writer of Hebrews spends nine chapters hammering away at the greatness of Jesus. In every possible conceivable way, he is greater. And then he turns in chapters 10, 11, 12, and next week in 13 to talk about, in light of his greatness, how should we live? And chapter 11 is this long list of heroes of the faith. By faith Abraham, by faith Noah, by faith Abel, by faith Rahab. They lived a certain way. When he finishes that chapter in verse 40, he says, God had something better planned for us so that only together with us would they, those heroes, be made perfect. And then he says, therefore since you're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Now, some people think this means that all the Old Testament heroes are like looking over the clouds, peering down at your life. Metaphorically, yes, but not actually. They're looking at Jesus, and he's better looking than you. Meaning they're not actually looking down, but symbolically they are. So witnesses could mean a, a witness in courtroom, a, testif a testimony, someone who testifies. Witness could mean someone who sees, right? Witness could also mean the life of, as a witness. Your life is itself a witness. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, those who have gone before. Their life testified and witnessed to the goodness of God. And now it's our turn to run. You see the metaphor? Life is a race. It's not a roller coaster. It's not a highway going nowhere. It's not a box of chocolates. It's not a hamster wheel. It's not a romance novel or anything else. Hebrews 12 says life's a race. It's a race marked out for us, going somewhere. Let us run with perseverance, we're told. 
It's not a sprint. It's not just endlessly running laps around the track. I used to have to run these laps up and down these stairs around the track when I was in college wrestling. I hated that because I was a heavyweight. We hate to run. The little guys would lap me, but it just felt like you're going nowhere. The image, think more about a cross-country race. This image. A course marked out. Some of it beautiful and open, some of it through the woods and over streams and rough terrain. It's a long-distance race over a course that's marked out for us. Actually, you might think of it as a relay race. The faith has been handed off to you. The baton's been passed to you. Our lives, your life, my life, the way we run our race counts for something in eternity. In the great story, the eternal story of faith, you and I have a part to play, a leg of the race to run. And it matters. They, those who went before us, looked forward in faith to what God would do in Christ. We now look backward in certainty to what he did in Christ. But we both look to Jesus. He links us he, together in this race, if you will. So what are the implications of seeing your life as a race, a course marked out for you? Well, for one thing, I think it means it will not be easy. It's not going to be easy. This is why the author says, let us run with perseverance or endurance. Run with perseverance. Let us run. How? With perseverance. Why? Because it's, the life is long and it's not going to be easy. How many of you are runners? How many of you were runners? <laughs> what happened, when, you, when you get into running, and I, I know this from the way back experience, you, the first half mile or so feels great. Like right? that runner's high, they call it. Feels good, doesn't it? I can do this forever. And then all of a sudden, no, I can't do this forever. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 again. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. The Greek word translated race here is the word agon. It's where we get our English word, can you guess? Agony. <laughs> that was a cheery thought. It could also be translated contest, struggle, even wrestling match. It's a course marked out for you. An endurance test. Now you might be thinking, well that sounds great. That sounds like a great story, Pastor Jeff. Gee, a long distance agonizing race is a story I want to be part of. Sign me up. But actually it's telling you the truth. Unless you're just in total denial, you already know life is hard. You already know life isn't easy. You already know there are challenges that you would not choose and didn't look for and feel ill-equipped to face. It's just telling you the truth and putting it in context, making some sense of it. This is telling us that suffering and pain and struggle are unavoidable and even necessary in the life of faith. The question I think for you and for me and for all of us is this. What place does suffering have in your story? you have a place? Where does it fit? If your story is a romance novel or a hamster wheel, right, or however you define what shapes your life, where, where does suffering fit? Where does pain fit? The truth is I don't think we have much of a theology of suffering in contemporary Christianity at all, and certainly not our contemporary culture. We have huge industries, billion-dollar industries designed to eliminate suffering, alleviate suffering, anesthetize us to it. Remove it. But this whole section of Hebrews, this whole part of chapter 12, is about running a long-distance, difficult, painful race. In fact, in verse 11, which I didn't read for you, it wasn't on the screen, but I'll read for you now, we read these words, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. The Greek word for trained is the word gymnazo, where we get our word gymnasium. There's training, there's purpose in pain, if we see it that way. I think there are two equally present perspectives the Bible gives us about suffering and pain in human life. Number one, clearly the Bible says suffering and pain are the result of evil and sin. God didn't design it. God doesn't, doesn't 
snap his fingers and decide who gets cancer. So it doesn't work that way. Suffering is a result of evil and sin in the world. Number two, God can use suffering and pain to shape us, even though we're in the midst of it, even though it is the result of evil and sin. George MacDonald, in one of his unspoken sermons, writes, Everything difficult in our lives points to something more than our faith yet embraces. Everything difficult in our lives points to something more than your the philosophy or theory of life yet embraces. I mean, if you come up against something that's hard and difficult and painful, what do you do with that? How do you address it? If, if your story doesn't have a place for that, are you undone? Do you despair? Your story frames your expectations of life. I, off, I, I really think that a biggest part of our problem is really not often the thing we're facing. The thing we're facing can be difficult and painful and hard, but a bigger part of our issue is really that we're not prepared for it. That we're wallowing in self-pity, that we're confused, that we're anxious, that we're despairing because of it, because we didn't expect this. Why me? I remember my father and I was diagnosed with cancer, and we were all asking, why, why you? You just retired after 32 years as the vice president at Wheaton College. You have this plan for your retirement days. Why you? His, his response was, why not me? People die all the time. Why would I expect that I'm going to be immune to all suffering and pain? It was a remarkable response. He had a place for it, in other words. It fit in the story. It doesn't make it easy, but it means it makes sense. Second, run with clear vision. Run with clear vision. Now, you'll have to take this on faith, but in 1998, I actually ran the Chicago Marathon. I know, you're skeptical, but I did. I actually finished the Chicago Marathon as well. Didn't just run in it. I ran for over four and a half hours. That's twice as long as the winner. So I ran for twice as long. That guy quit early. <laughs> and I... This phrase in verse 1, we're told to throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that easily entangles us. I vividly remember, you know, they line you up in those days based on how, how slow you or fast you think you're going to run. They have big signs that say four hours, four and a half hours. I was back where there were no more signs. That's where I was standing. And you're just shuffling for the first couple miles because there's thousands of people. And I vividly remember how we're shuffling for the first three, four, five, six miles. There are people are just taking off their clothing like, like sweat because it's October. Their sweatshirts and their jackets and gloves and hats and just throwing them down and running on. Literally, the, rate, the course of the first couple miles was lined with people with discarded running clothing. And there were homeless people picking all that stuff up and putting it in bags as we ran. That when I read this phrase, that, that, that verse 1, that always reminds me of that. Let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that entangles. Strip it off. Cast it aside. You don't need it. It's holding you back. The idea actually goes with what we read in verses 2 and 3. Hebrews 12, 2 and 3 read this way. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Fix our eyes, we're told, on Jesus. The, the Greek phrase fixing our eyes means to block out everything else, to have, as it were, tunnel vision, to intentionally not focus on all the other things we could be looking at, but to have singular focus on Jesus. So strip off all unnecessary burdens, Lay aside all entangling sins and focus and block out all distractions. Why? So you can see Jesus clearly. Run with perseverance. The race is long and it's going to be difficult and you need to have the right focus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. I remember I ran with a young man named Tim who uh, had discipled and helped lead to Christ and I was his youth pastor, and we ran together this marathon, and I don't remember the mile marker, 19 or 20, or somewhere along that point, and I, I was really hurting. And I remember looking off to my right, and a guy who looked like death jogging passed me. And I thought, that guy looks terrible. And then I realized, he just passed me. <laughs> what, is, what do I look like? 
And shortly after that, I, th I hit what they call the wall. I wanted to quit with every step. I thought this was a terrible idea. Who cares if I finish? Nobody will even notice. I just want to stop running. And Tim said, Pastor Jeff, have you hit the wall? And I didn't answer, but I went. <laughs> and he, he prayed for me. The guy I led to Christ prayed that God would give me the strength. Shortly after that, we came toward McCormick Place where you kind of go under it, and then about two and a half miles away, you can see the finish line. And I thought, I can crawl two miles. I'm going to finish. I'm going to make it. Why? Because I could see the finish line. I, I could see the end. I could see the point, the goal. It changed everything. There's a p period at which you're running on the south side, and it, nobody's cheering anymore. There's no, there's no crowds. You're just getting through it. And then it comes where you can see the finish. And that's what I think what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Fix your eyes on the point, on the, on the reason you run, on the one who's gone before you, Jesus. Take your eyes off of him, and you put them on to how hard it is. You're not going to make it. The point's not to win. The point is to run well and finish well, focused on Christ. That's what Paul says, right? The end of his life. 2 Timothy 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 7. I have fought the fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown which awaits all of us. Finished the race and kept the faith. Why? Because he's fixed it on Jesus. And before I move on here, I just need to ask a couple questions of you. I want you to think about this. What burdens are you carrying that are weighing you down? The author says, lay aside everything that hinders us. Put it off. Like clothing, strip it off and throw it away. What, maybe it's a burden of the past. Maybe shame. Maybe guilt or things done to you or things you've done. And you've been carrying that your whole life and it's weighing you down and you can't run the race God has marked out for you while carrying that stuff. What sin are you allowing yourself to get entangled in that's making it hard for you to run the race God has marked out for you? What sin of pride or sin of integrity or lack of? What sexual sin? Sin with what you see. Sins of what you say. That maybe you think aren't that big a deal and nobody really knows, but they're preventing you from running the way God designed you to run. And last, what distractions? Maybe it's not a burden of the past or a present sin, but you're just distracted. Fix your eyes on Jesus, right? It means block out all else. What distractions are you allowing? The writer of Hebrews says, Run with perseverance, the race marked out for you. You have a course and I have a course. Ultimately, the end is the same. To, be, to finish the race, fix our eyes on Jesus. But it's not the same race. Your, your life is different than my life. The race marked out for you. It's challenging enough, isn't it? Life is challenging enough without you adding to that by being weighed down with burdens of your past or present, by messing around with sin that's slowing you down and damaging your soul and those around you, or by being distracted by all these things. You have, it's hard enough, this race. So the writer says, take that stuff off. Cast it aside. Don't carry that anymore. One of my favorite examples, and we, I wish we had time to show this, but I'll just tell you, is the movie The Mission. If you've never seen The Mission, you know, as soon as the bears are over, go watch it. You should watch this. It's, it's brilliant. And in the movie, there's a character played by Robert De Niro named Ro Rodrigo Mendoza. He's a slave trader, Spanish slave trader in South America, and a murderer. And he ends up killing uh, his brother unintentionally in a, in a fit of jealous rage. He's so racked with guilt that he's in prison over this. But Jeremy Irons, who plays this Jesuit priest, comes and gives him a chance at redemption. And he says, there's no redemption for me. There's no penance hard enough for me. He just can't believe that he could be forgiven. And one of the most grueling but gripping and beautiful scenes, actually, is the scene where he's carrying this rope, this uh, rope bag, if you will, full of armor and swords and helmets, symbols of his past life. And he's carrying it all the way up this, this mountain trek through the jungle in the Amazon rainforest 
to get to the Warani Indians. And he won't let it go. Liam Neeson, who plays a priest, tries to cut it loose, and he won't allow it. He reties it and won't let it go. And it's just a grueling scene. And finally, he gets to the top where the Indians come, and they recognize him as the man who used to capture their friends and family, and they're scared. And one of the Warani runs up with a knife and puts it to his throat. And there's this tense moment. Is he going to kill him? And instead, he takes the knife and he cuts away the rope. And he rolls that burden. I get emotional just thinking about it. He rolls that burden off the cliff and it splashes down. And then, then Rodrigo just weeps because he's free. Finally, the sin is, that entangled him and the burden he's been carrying is cast off and he's free. And he's a new man because of that. It's a beautiful picture of what the writer of Hebrews is saying to us here. Let us cast off those things we carry which God has already paid for at the cross. Get out of the entanglements that are slowing you down and tripping you up. Fix your eyes on Jesus. You're not going to make it if you don't do that. You will not run the race marked out for you if you won't do that. Last, we run with humble confidence. First, with perseverance and endurance, right? It's a long-distance race, and it's not easy. Second, with the right, clear focus, Jesus Christ, the one who's gone before us. And then with humble confidence. Now, there's an interesting turn in the passage in chapter 12. Uh, the writer of Hebrews makes a shift. He, he changed, this is not something that they recommend to public speakers or authors, mixing your metaphors. But the writer of Hebrew changes metaphors midstream. It was running and training and, and, and the race. And then he shifts to children and father and discipline and like rearing children. He changes the metaphor. And I think he does it for a very intentional and beautiful reason. Let me read verses 5 and 6 to you. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Let's talk about this for a minute. He says, you've forgotten something. You've lost sight of something, right? That's why you fix your eyes on Jesus, right? But you've stopped doing that. What happened to Peter when he was walking on the water as soon as he took his eyes off Jesus? Yeah, sank. You've forgotten something. You've lost your focus. Let me remind you, the writer says, the, the hardship you're facing. And don't forget, he's writing to Christians who grew up Jewish who are facing persecution for their faith in Jesus Christ. And he's saying, you have forgotten the hardships you're facing are not because God's out to get you. He's not trying to punish you. They're not, it's not just misfortune. It's not just unfair. God loves you as a father. You've forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons and daughters, as children. He's actually treating you as his children, even in the midst of your pain. This is a hard thing to grasp. The Greek word, this, the word discipline is used over and over again in the latter half of the passage we read. And the Greek word for discipline is paideia. It's where we get our English word pediatrics from. It refers to parents training, rearing, caring for, instructing their children. We tend to think of discipline in our culture as either like physical training or punishment, right? You must be disciplined. That's, a, that's an incomplete view of the biblical perspective. That it's loving correction and loving training. Can you and I come to see the struggles and the pain in our lives as a way that God gets his grace and goodness and glory into us? And I don't mean that he causes every terrible thing to happen to you. But I do mean he uses it. I do mean he uses it. Notice in verse 5 we're told, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart. Those two phrases are interesting to me. Do not make light and do not lose heart. To make light would be like to just sniff up lip, oh, it's no big deal, it's going to be fine, like stoicism, to ignore that it's painful. As a Christian, we don't pretend like life isn't hard. We don't walk around act, putting on a happy face and make light of it, acting like everything's okay when it's not. That's not, what we're called, that's not what we're called to do. On the other hand, he says, do not lose heart, meaning despair. Neither are we called to despair. Like, why is this happening? There's no hope and God must not love me. Right, two extremes. One is to make light, flippant, doesn't matter, ignore, that, act like everything's fine when it's not. 
The other is to fall off the cliff, right, into despair. Where is God? Why has he abandoned me? We see those both played out in our culture all the time. You probably do as well. We're called to a different way. Why not? Because God's your father, and he loves you, and he's with you in the midst of it. Dallas Willard writes this in his book, um, In Search of Guidance. He says, Non-destructive, designed pain, brought into our lives by a loving God for his good purposes. That's how we're called to see suffering. Non-destructive, designed pain, brought into our lives by a loving God for his good purposes. Now, I recognize there are some people listening to this right now who are thinking, you don't know what I'm facing. How could you say God designed that or brought that into my life? You're right, I don't. And I think God grieves over our pain and the things that are, happen in our lives that are difficult. But he also wants to shape us in the midst of it. Let me read verses 8 through 10. We get a little better picture of this. If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. In other words, this is a sign that you belong to God. Verse 9. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. I've got three kids, two in college, one left at home. I'm an imperfect father. Like many of you that have children and grandchildren, I love my kids, and it's hard to put into words what you feel for your children. You, it's hard to express that. And I have at times disciplined them, and I've always, deep in my heart, wanted it to be for their good. But if I'm honest, there's been times when it's been, I'm just irritated. I'm just angry. I'm just selfish. It's more about my embarrassment, or, or it's, and it hasn't been good for them. But never, never, never with God. He's the perfect father. He disciplines us, brings circumstances into our lives, or uses those things that happen for our good and his glory. Even if you can't see it. Really, if you think about it, to despair in the face of, of pain and suffering, to despair of God's goodness or God's pur good purposes, is the ultimate form of arrogance. Do you know what I mean? Because what you're saying, if you fall into despair, why would God, God can't be good? Where is he? This can, why would he let this happen? What you're saying is, because I can't see any purpose for this, there cannot be one. Well, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because you're infinite and omniscient and know all things. Remember what he says. You've forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as children. You're a child, in other words, spiritually speaking. And God is your father. Which of you parents here, did your kids, when you were disciplining them, get it? I understand, Father. I was spanked more than my, my sister was never spanked. I was, I was spanked enough for both of my sisters, put it that way. I had issues when I was a youngster. My parents had to rein me in. But I never once, when my dad was disciplining me, said, Father, I thank you for your vision for the long term for who I would become. Thank you for this grounding. Thank you for this spanking. Thank you for withholding these things from me because I realize it's shaping me into the man that you intend for me to be. And ultimately, it's actually God's work, so thank you, Father. Never said that. Not once. You can ask my dad. He'll vouch for me. Are we different as adults with our Heavenly Father? I can't see it. I don't get it. How can you be sure? If, if life is a race marked out for you by a loving father, and it's long distance, and it's painful, and it's hard, and he's with you, how can you be sure that he's good and he's with you? How do you know? Let me go back to verse 2. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. Why, why did, it says, who for the joy set before him ran the race? Why did he run? Why did Jesus run the race that marked out for him? Do you remember the scene in the garden? He wanted out of this race, didn't he? If there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Why did he go through with it? Why did he finish that race? He already had the glory. He already had the power. He already had the favor. Why did he do that? He had all power and authority in heaven and earth. Why? It's one thing he didn't have. 
us. What is the joy set before him? To accomplish God's good purpose. What was that? To redeem the world. To bring back his children. To forgive your sin and my sin and restore that which was lost and broken and weighed down with sin and guilt and shame. That's the joy set before him. In other words, in his suffering, he sought us. And so we seek him in ours. I, I, I'll close by sharing, I think, the best story outside of the Bible I've seen of this, personally, up close. And many of you will know this story, or know part of it anyway. It's a story of a woman who was part of our church family years ago named Kim McCart. Some of you will know Kim and Robin and their family well. Kim and Robin were the first volunteers that, on the tr first trip I ever took as a youth pastor here. They were key volunteers in, in youth ministry for many years. I saw their kids come through high school ministry when I was youth pastor and then beyond. I saw them have, get married and have children. And I also saw Kim diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. Many of us saw that. And I saw the way that she suffered through it. And, and I burned in my mind forever on this very stage at her memorial service, her niece stood right up here. Her niece is a striking, beautiful young lady who was a fitness model, I think, at the time. And she told this story. She says, I was an agnostic, some, somewhat atheist, and was not interested in the faith of my parents or my aunt and uncle. I loved my Aunt Kim, and she was always sweet and kind, but I wasn't interested. I was living my life for me. I cared about my Aunt Kim. I thought it was unfair that, that the universe would give her cancer, but I didn't think God was involved. And then she said that she had a bad breakup with her boyfriend of many years, who I think she was living with at the time, and that she contracted pneumonia and couldn't go to a, a photo shoot, which would, would have been key for her career. And she said, I was so bitter and angry. My life went in the tank because I had a, of a breakup and pneumonia. And I went to visit my aunt and uncle with the family for the holidays. And there I was with my Aunt Kim at her bedside. And she said, I realized she is the same sweet, joyful, faithful, kind person she's always been, and she's about to die. My life was turned upside down because I got sick and a boyfriend dumped me. She said, whatever I thought I had, it was gone when pain came. But whatever she has stayed in the midst of pain. And she says, that was the turning point. It was seeing my aunt suffer. And I, I, I can't, when you read Hebrews 12, fix your eyes on Jesus. That's what Kim did. That's what she did. Not perfect person, but to the end, her eyes were fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of her faith. And God used that to redeem a life. Doesn't mean God caused it. Doesn't mean God rejoiced in her suffering. It means he used it. He refined it. He's glorified in it even. What's the story of your life, friends? We've all got a story shaping our lives. The writer of Hebrews says, you're part of the grand, eternal, great story of which Jesus is the author. And the best way to describe it to you, it's like a race. In fact, you've been past the baton, and it's your turn to run. And your race, your life marked out for you counts in eternity. There are witnesses to how you run. So run with endurance, because it's not easy. Fix your eyes on Jesus, because he's the point. And run with the humble confidence that he's your good father, regardless of what comes. Let's bow in prayer together. Father, this, this passage is difficult for us, if we're honest. We would prefer that life was easy and there weren't hard questions. And yet we thank you, God, that you're, you, you give us the perfect answer. And that is your son, Jesus. He is the answer to our struggle, the author of our faith, the one we fix our eyes on. Help us by your spirit and your grace to throw off the things that hinder us and weigh us down. Help us to strip off the sins that entangle our feet and to fix our eyes on you, Lord Jesus. We thank you and we praise you in your name. Amen.